Do you have the empty reed case blues? Well, luckily for you, Singing Dog Double Reeds is an online double reed shop and one of the largest suppliers of high quality and affordable professional and student reeds for oboe and bassoon in the USA. Please visit us at www.singindog.com to see all of our products and fill up that reed case. Hey guys, let me tell you something. Jenna Ingle loves the oboe. She's built her business on providing high-quality, handmade reeds, education, and a sympathetic ear to oboists across the country. When you order from Jenna Ingle Reeds, you get prompt communication, reeds or cane handcrafted to your specifications, and cheerful, friendly customer service. All orders are mailed within one week, sometimes much faster. Single orders and monthly reed subscriptions are also welcome, and she's going to work with you to find the right combination of response, resistance, stability, and flexibility that's right for you. Double Read Dish listeners can use the code DISH, that's all caps, for 10% off your first order at JenetEngel.com. Hi, I'm Galit Kaunitz. And I'm Jackie Wilson. And you're listening to Double Read Dish, a podcast for oboists, bassoonists, and the people who love them. Jackie, happy new year. Happy 2017. Or, no. 2018. We're doing great so far. Going really well. So (laughs) confident. (laughs) It's like somebody who's very confidently driving down a one-way street the wrong way. Wah, wah, my bad. Uh, Happy 2018. 2018. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, we did a call for New Year's resolutions. Mm-hmm. And I would like to read our listeners' New Year's res- resolutions before we get into ours because they are pretty fabulous. The first one is from friend of the podcast, Kara Lamore. Woohoo! And she says she's going to learn how to circular breathe so her face stops looking like emoji in those long phrases. <laughs> Kara, circular breathing face does not look any more attractive. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe people who uh, are very adept at it, but I go full Dizzy Gillespie sometimes, and it is not <laughs> cute. So, <laughs> Well, good luck, Kara. I'm sure she's going to rock it. Absolutely. I also loved one that Jordan Farber sent, which is having a full drying rack at all times. Get it. Which I assume doesn't mean just fill up your drying rack and then leave it for the entirety of the year. I I think it means (laughs) to be continually making reads, but... Let's hope. (laughs) A very attractive listener named Becky Chambers, a.k.a. my wife, (laughs) wrote in and... (laughs) <laughs> Her resolution is read more books, regular books, and play through etude books. That's an awesome one. Both type of books. Yes, mm-hmm. good. And we also had some academic resolutions, uh, nailing senior recital, maintaining 4.0, and then just generally being stress-free, work less, and make more reads, which I think we probably all have those resolutions, don't you think? You guys are so ambitious. I love it. So we kind of did our resolutions on the last episode, <clears throat> right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I thought we could maybe emulate uh, a year-end activity that one of our favorite podcasts, Call Your Girlfriend, does, which is they um, call it Top Shelf, and they mm-hmm. go through their favorite moments of the previous year and kind of use it as a point of reflection. So we're going to copy them (laughs) (laughs) and talk about some of our favorite moments. So what do you want to start with? Well, I have two top shelf pieces of music that I discovered this year. Well, I mean, I didn't discover them. They already existed, but I just hopped on the train this year. Um, I started incorporating the Salviani etudes into my warm-up. 
as well as the Fairling, but, you know, we all know the Fairling, us oboists. So the Salviani Volume 2, I just do in whatever key, you know, the, the scale that I'm doing that week. And, I mean, talk about a finger warm-up. It's awesome. It's just like, I guess, 16 short exercises that work different patterns in the in the key. And it's not crazy hard, but it definitely gets you warm. So I've been loving that. And then I also have been really enjoying performing um, Simon Sargent's Homage to Hafiz, which is a really beautiful work for oboe and piano. Oh, actually, um, Melissa Bosma from Oklahoma State, who is the guest for my Double Read Day in February, will be playing that piece. So I can't wait to hear it. Oh, you're going to love it. You're going to love it. It's so beautiful. Um, What's your top shelf moment? My top shelf sheet music find is actually one I came across on this podcast, the Ula Christendahl Drills, uh, which he talked about extensively in his interview. And then I went, I got to check these out. And ever since they arrived in the mail, they have been on my uh, music stand and I have used them. And now I am a a disciple of Ula and Daily Drill Master. So that has Love been really, it. yeah. I ordered it too. I can't wait. I've been starting to get into it, but there's a lot of like pros that you have to read. So I'm when I get back home, I'm going to like read it and then, you know, adapt it to oboe stuff. I can't wait. Yeah, and there, you have to transcribe by sight, which is a really good exercise, but it did take mm-hmm. me a while to get into. There, were de- there was definitely a period where I was practicing drills to be able to use it as a warm-up, and, mm-hmm. but then once I was at that point, it was just like, let's hit the ground running, mm-hmm. wear off. Mm-hmm. Love it. What about our top shelf favorite performances of the year? Mm. I loved my most recent recital that I gave in September and the Marcello performances. I don't know. I just had some really good ones this year. Got to play some really good orchestral music. I don't know if I can pick just one. Do you have one? I think maybe my favorite on my recital, which was actually in January, so quite a long time ago, I did a transcription of the Piazzolla Grand Tango, Mm. uh, and not only was it really fun, but there was a period of time where I was like, why did I do this to myself? This is (laughs) a very hard transcription. (laughs) And then so to kind of like have it come together and uh, be a really good performance that I was proud of was kind of this nice affirming moment. Mm -hmm. Um, So... Uh, that comes to mind, but yeah, lots of really fun performances and good collaborations this year. What about fail? <laughs> we talked about our <laughs> peaks. What about our pit? Well, <clears throat> so I mentioned the Marcello before. <laughs> there was one performance. I, I did this like four times uh, over the last month or so and there there was one performance where the second movement starts with the second violin right and it's just six slow eighth notes for one measure and then the first violin comes in in the second measure with six slow eighth notes and then the viola comes in in the third measure with six slow eighth notes and then the oboe comes in and so I was Ready to go. And uh, I nod to the second violinist who was new. It was like a sub situation. So they hadn't been to any of the rehearsals or any of the performances previously. But I was like, oh, not a big deal. I'm sure it's fine. (laughs) And the second violin started the slow movement double time. And so I was like, "Uh oh. (laughs) And then the first violin came in. Uh, he just decided when the second measure was going to be, and he came in with the slow eighth. And so I was like, okay, we'll adjust, we'll adjust. But we never adjusted. Didn't never get adjusted. Back. Never got it back. And so I just decided to come in. And I was like, okay, well, we'll, we'll figure it out from the chords. But it took so long. <laughs> well, luckily for you, you were the soloist, and the soloist is always right. So. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? It's all right. And you know, the audience still enjoyed it. 
there were people coming up after me being like, we loved it. And I was like, great. That's great. <laughs> what was your performance fail? Well, it's actually not a performance fail. And unfortunately, I can't blame it on anyone but myself. <laughs> Uh, but I was giving a uh, presentation at a music educators conference that shall remain unnamed. <laughs> um, and the presentation went like so well. It was actually super packed. And I was just like, yeah, I love how this went. And then we were into the question and answer portion. Um, and, and that went really well, too. And then someone asked a question about um, students and, and size and the bassoon. And I thought I understood their question. I, didn't, I genuinely did. Um, and I remember my answer was, well, you can just get your student a taller chair. And then went on to the next um, <laughs> question. And the person who a asked the question made this, like, very confused face. And it wasn't until <laughs> hours later that I was driving home that I realized that they had asked about, like, seat strap length and if the student is too tall or short for the seat strap and how high or low the chair is would have nothing to do with that. <laughs> and so, I, yeah, that was my fail, my nonsensical answer as the expert presenter at a music <laughs> educator conference. <laughs> but listen carefully. When people ask you questions, mm -hmm. listen carefully. That's my <laughs> Don't just glaze over and think, I got this. <laughs> I got this. Get him a, girl, get him a taller chair. Everything will be fine. <laughs> That's going to be my answer to everything. Hey, how can I fix this three? Just get him a taller chair. Get a It'll taller be great. chair. I'm allergic <laughs> to peanuts, girl. Taller chair. That's all you need. <laughs> So we wanted to end on kind of a corny note, maybe, with a top shelf teaching moment of 2017. Mm-hmm. What's yours? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to brag. One of my students won the concerto competition at Southern Miss. Oh, yeah. And I know that's not, like, technically my moment, <laughs> but I'm <laughs> claiming it. <laughs> I was so proud. I promised the studio that if an oboist won the concerto competition, that I would buy the studio a pizza party. So we had two people enter, and one of them won. And so then I had to buy them a pizza party. <laughs> That's awesome. Congrats. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. I take all the credit. Just kidding. <laughs> what was your top shelf teaching moment? My top shelf moment came very recently, and it is super corny. Um, and it's actually not a double read teaching moment. I do some classroom teaching here at Southeast. Um, and I came in just after the semester ended to my office to do some paperwork. And there was a envelope taped to my door. And I opened it, and it was this thank you card about how I meant a lot to this student and he's graduating and so he's going to really miss working with me and thank you for your support uh and so I stood in my office it's like crying like a baby like <laughs> what a thoughtful card <laughs> <laughs> it's all worth it in the end <laughs> it was just nice that they took the time to let me know that they appreciated me and it was so unnecessary but so appreciate, appreciated and um, yeah just such a nice way to go into break that is so sweet it is very sweet students give your teachers <laughs> cards <laughs> if you love your teacher make them cry <laughs> No matter where you live, Double or Nothing is there for you. Dedicated to providing excellent handmade oboe and bassoon reads to discriminating double read players of all ages and abilities, Double or Nothing Reads has recently expanded to sell double read tools and supplies, gift items, and more. 
This includes knives, knife blades, thread, staples, cane, bags, and resources for students. As authorized Fox and Yamaha dealers, they offer an extensive range of oboes and bassoons for all levels. In addition, they sell quality used instruments on consignment. If you're looking for private oboe lessons but can't find anyone nearby, Double or Nothing Reads offers oboe lessons via Skype. Visit doubleornothingreads.com for good quality and affordable readmaking supplies and accessories, lessons, instruments, and much more. So we all know that Genda Industries is known for their reed knives, sharpening, and overall amazing quality in the double reed world. But there is so much more going on in Genda Industries. Did you know that you can get oboe and bassoon reeds from Genda Industries at the Artisan Mall? The Genda Industries Artisan Mall it's like a farmer's market, and it's filled with talented local and regional reed makers selling their own reeds. It's a great way to try out some new reeds from new makers. And who knows, one day maybe your reeds will be for sale. Add the code DRDGENDA, that's all capitals, no spaces, at checkout, and get 10% off any gender reed knife, maintenance kit, reed knife sharpening book, cutting block, and reed tool row. Visit them at GendaIndustries.com. Oh, and they're much more than just reed knives. We are thrilled to welcome to the podcast Rebecca Heller, solo bassoonist and longtime core member of the International Contemporary Ensemble. Welcome to Double Read Dish, Rebecca. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. I'd like to start by asking how you started playing the bassoon. Mm, yes, that is a common question, especially when people are uh, mostly asking what that thing is that is on my face. <laughs> the big oboe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're like, so how did you choose the oboe? And uh, uh, my my mother actually was a really talented musician. She was never a professional, but a flutist, and she sang. And so I always knew I was going to play an instrument, um, but I, I didn't really know which one. But uh, she would tell me, all these stories about how many flute players there were. And I was like, that sounds so boring. I want to play something that nobody else plays. <laughs> and I was nine, and uh, she somehow introduced me to the Double Reed family, and my best friend at the time wanted to play the oboe because her sister did. And so I was like, I'll take the big one. I don't even know what it's called. Um, sure. <laughs> and I lived in a really small town in the Adirondack Park in upstate New York. Um, there were 60 people in my town. We were bused to a nearby K-12 through school that uh, served three counties and uh, it's a miracle looking back that they even had one and so we went to my band director before people were even choosing instruments and said I'd like to play the bassoon he was like are you kidding me <laughs> and like, they, he opened this cabinet and dusted off this enormous plastic bassoon that must have been from like World War II like no one had played it wow. then it was amazing and so of course there was like no YouTube or anything at that time to figure it out so we brought it home, and it took my mom and I like an hour just to figure out how to put it together. <laughs> and there was this like moldy plastic reed in the cage. Oh, <laughs> and I just like, I figured, I played Mary Had a Little Lamb, and my face was buzzing, and I was like, this is so cool. And I, I remember my brothers who played brass instruments were like, that's so ugly. And I was like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> this is my new passion. <laughs> but, so that's how I started. I was really young. I mean, my, my fingers wouldn't even reach... I couldn't play C sharp um, without having a D key down. <laughs> uh, so, but I, I was into it and I, w I wasn't like super obsessive about it, but you know, when you're a kid or actually when you're any age, it's fun to do something you're good at. And it was just something that kind of came naturally to me. And so I kind of stuck with it. Um, well, my first read was also plastic read. So uh, <laughs> we're a member of the same tribe. <laughs> and we were like, wait, I have to make these? Like, this is not cool. <laughs> but now we're right. we're going back to this plastic revolution. I don't know. We'll see. We can get into that later. This was not a legere read. Well, it was more when I finally got a, a cane read. I was like, oh, I don't have to sound that way. Oh. <laughs> There's something like so primal about that sound. Mm -hmm. It's true. Maybe not so bassoon -y, but it's very <laughs> of the earth. <laughs> So when did you decide to pursue the bassoon professionally, and how did your educational choices after high school, um, how were they influenced by that choice? Oh, that's a good question. So I think even when I was applying to colleges, like I didn't, I wasn't like, oh, I'm going to become a bassoonist. Like that never felt like a viable career path to me. 
But I remember we had this computer before the internet in my guidance counselor. This was in 1996. A guidance counselor's office in my high school had this computer that would connect to a database of all colleges, conservatories, any anything like that around the country. And so I went into the guidance counselor's office and I typed in my two interests, which were bassoon performance and women's studies, which is now called gender studies. And the oh, there was only one match. It was like, do, 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 that matrix. And it ended up being Oberlin. Mm. And I was like, wow, what is this place? It's in Ohio. That sucks. But wow. <laughs> <laughs> it printed out this like a hundred page, like do, 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 thing about Oberlin. And I read it and I was obsessed. And I was like, this is where I'm going. This is all I want to do. And I knew that I wanted to do a double degree program because I don't know, I kind of, I, I knew that I was sort of lazy and that if I went to a conservatory where I didn't have to take academic classes, then I wouldn't. And I wanted to force myself to get a quote unquote, you know, normal or more well-rounded education um, than, than some conservatories provide. So I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to do this double degree thing. And I did. Um, and actually ICE was, was founded just after Oberlin and all of the people all, not all of them, but many of the people that I still have very close working and musical relationships with, uh, I started those relationships at Oberlin. So I'm, mm-hmm. I feel really lucky that I ended up choosing to go there and didn't really have like a safety school. <laughs> so it was good that I got in. So you are a champion of contemporary music. Um, and what got you into it in the first place? Was it something that you always had a liking for or was it developed over time or was there like a significant piece for you that's a really good question you know at Oberlin I wasn't so um plugged into that world it wasn't anything that was on my radar at that time my teacher at Oberlin George Sakakini is amazing and he is like such a gifted pedagogue and I I am really grateful to him for making me sound really pretty and making that like a really big focus. And, and um, but that wasn't a part of, of my life there. And then uh, I ended up doing my master's in Texas with Kristen Wolf Jensen, who is also amazing. And that was the first time after I'd done the double degree thing that I, I actually had time to practice. And I practiced like four hours a day and I was super committed, but I still wasn't really like I was in the new music ensemble and I, I thought all of that was super interesting. But uh, the way that I'm involved now, like I, I couldn't have predicted that at that time. Um, and then I started on this orchestral path and not because I had to or because I, I felt that that's really what I wanted to do in my life, but I didn't really know there were other options. I didn't know what else I could do as a bassoonist. So from UT, I went to Chicago, got into the Chicago Civic Orchestra. I was in there for a year, and then I joined New World Symphony, and I was in New World for three years. And from there, I went to Jacksonville Symphony. I I was principal bassoonist of the Jacksonville Symphony for one season. And I think I can really thank that opportunity. Um, I I was really grateful that that all happened in that order because I I was thinking about moving to New York at that time. Um, Claire Chase, the founder of ICE, who I had known from Oberlin had just said, look, we need a bassoonist in ice. You know, we, we don't have much rep right now, but we consider moving to New York. And that was exhilarating for me, but also really terrifying. I was like, I don't know anyone in New York. I didn't go to school in New York. I don't have any contacts there. And I knew ice would be very, very tangential and part time. So I, I was scared and I said, maybe, but not right now. Let me go do this Jacksonville thing first. And so I did, and I played in Jacksonville for a year and met a lot of really wonderful people, um, but also just realized that that is not the life and the career that I want. Um, I'm, I want to play solo music. I wanted to play chamber music, and I wanted to have a level of autonomy uh, over my career and the music that I played and the people that I played with that would never be possible in that world. So I felt really thankful to get that job because it allowed me to say, okay, I've done that. I was able to do that and like, no, thank you, but no, thank you. And so I just moved to New York and like I sold my car. Like I was so broke. I moved to New York with like no money, but I was like totally fearless because I was like, I saw, I felt like I could see it all in front of me. I was like, so what? I have health insurance. I'm making more money than I've ever made in my life in this job. But all of that is worthless. If I feel like this isn't the music that I want to be playing and this isn't the life the creative life that I want to have. 
So it, it actually like took away all of that fear. And I was like, I'm, I'm resourceful. I'm smart. And I like, I worked my ass off to even like get crappy jobs that are hard mm-hmm. to get work, you know? And I like, I like interned for someone like selling jewelry for no money. And then like within a week, I was like, I want to work with this other person. And then I found how to get a waiting tables job. And I just had all the jobs for years. I waited tables and did all this stuff. And Jacksonville was awesome enough to let me play contrabassoon for a year after after that, and so that helped me pay rent. I would go down there once a month, and the whole time starting to play with ice and uh, expand my contacts in New York and start freelancing. So in leaving school, I feel like a lot of us are kind of given these, these two main paths. You know, you can either go into academia and be a professor, or you can pursue the orchestral mm-hmm. route and anything else is often labeled um, not necessarily a second choice or like a silver medal kind of, you know what I mean? Um, You should want to prioritize those two things. Mm -hmm. And so you had one of the paths, you know what I mean? And then you elected to go down this other route. Did you have anything to unpack mentally in terms of deciding to be at least initially, a freelancer in order to pursue um, personal artistic fulfillment. What's kind of the the reception and internal process as you forged your own path? Well, I definitely had backlash from my parents most of the <laughs> They were like, what, you finally got a job and now you're leaving to be a waitress? Uh, but actually, for me, the real internal struggle came with taking the Jacksonville job. That was the real struggle because I knew it wasn't really what I wanted. And I, I knew that, but I felt like I, I just, in order to really put that to bed, I had to give it a shot. Um, and then as soon as it happened and I knew it wasn't right for me, then it was just relief and it was like excitement. So there was no, for me, all the angst was, was in deciding in that moment after New World, do I move to New York right away or do I take this job in Jacksonville? And and that was really hard. And in fact, I, I found an apartment and I was like, I'm gonna like, pro- I'm gonna find someone to sum like this for the, for the season and I'm probably gonna be back in the spring. Like I knew even from the beginning. Um, so I, I, and yeah, it was really, really liberating from that point on. Like I was like, this is great. Like I'm gonna make, I had no idea what I was gonna make up my life or my career, but I was like, it's gonna be more exciting for me. So what would you say to a young person who is maybe in school or just out of school who is internally feeling like, I don't think it's academia and I don't think it's symphony playing, what advice would you have for them? Oh, my goodness. That's such a good question. And I actually get this question a lot um, from young people who reach out to me. They find videos on on my website or or YouTube, and they're like, this is so cool. Like, I think also these two paths don't feel right for me. Um, And I think – the most important thing and the hardest thing at the end of the day is to find out what it is that's exciting for you musically because life is long. Um, And it's really important to recognize that thing and go after it. But that's a lot of times the absolute hardest thing because we have been told for so long that there are only these two paths and they're really hard to do. Mm -hmm. Um, And most people won't get to do them. And what a bummer that is. But Mm -hmm. think about, like, the vast world and all of these other incredibly creative and talented musicians who are graduating from music schools every year who also want to do different things. I think I would also just encourage people to really use their communities um, in school, get to know people. And most most of the time, those people are going to be their lifelines and your creative partners in the future. It's a really great way to capitalize on that. So something else I think about a lot and that a lot of young bassoonists come to me with questions about is this idea of um, creating a career in music that is outside of the orchestra path or the teaching path as a secondary choice, as the other, and feeling like these these choices, and, and I think we all need to take responsibility um, for being a part of that world. I know that I certainly was for a long time. Um, But feeling like even though they have all these really creative ideas as chamber artists and as soloists and uh, forging their own path, that many people in their lives frame it 
as something that is other, um, that is not to be lauded like a, like a job that's easy to say and that everyone can recognize. Um, so I think I just want to offer a word of encouragement and also encourage us all in this double read community to recognize the brilliant careers of artists that don't necessarily, uh, look like, um, just playing in an orchestra or, or teaching at a school. I think there is so much amazing work happening in the world that is not only more artistically satisfying for those pursuing it, but also really important in terms of additions to the, the musical community. So I just want to say, um, just to not lose sight of, of that path, um, I think we can encourage the institutions that we're a part of um, to recognize these careers by doing so ourselves. And once we as a community start lauding the careers of people who are incredibly creative and, and diverse in what they're contributing, um, then then the organizations will follow. So I think it's our responsibility to take that on. Um, no, no organization will ever or institution will ever create change from the top down, but it's about the community um, recognizing this first because there's so many incredibly talented people out there, and you guys do an amazing job of highlighting the careers of a lot of them um, that, are, that, that look really different from what we think is, is out there, what I thought was out there when I was a young bassoonist in terms of career. And it's not like a second place um, what's the word? Like a, a consolation prize. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm more happy and satisfied and my career is also more stable than uh, I think it would have been in any orchestra. You know, I think for a long time it was considered the safe route, but now more orchestras are, are failing year after year, and it's really it's sad and it, it, makes, it makes me sad, and I, I, I wish that didn't happen to any organization, but now what was once considered the dangerous, scary path of, of creating your own career, being part of a collective or chamber music group or working as a soloist, now actually seems in many ways a, a safer way to do it. You have a, a lot more control over your finances, over your day-to-day, -day, over what your year looks like, and you can also say yes and no to some things um, and design your career that way. I can I can say in April um, I want to go be in a, a artist retreat and hold myself up and practice for a month. I can say I can choose I can budget for that and say you know I'll, I'll find a sub for for these gigs and there's a lot of flexibility baked into that that's really exciting and it gives you autonomy and agency over your career in a way that I never would have had as an orchestral musician. Well, and the same thing could be said for higher education because that is, as we know, yeah. changing rapidly and dramatically mm -hmm. as well. You're so right. Indeed, I think uh, trusting your gut is really, really the only way to go because at the end of the day, like this is too hard to do if you don't have to do it. Right? We're all in this because there's something that's really deep inside of us that has to do this thing. If we, if we wanted to just make money, we would, we're all smart, smart people. We would go work in finance or something else stolen. But we need, we do this because we have to. And I think honoring the parts of that that are the most real is the only safe thing to do at the end of the day. Amen. So you've done some, you've put out two albums and you play with ICE, and you do a lot of uh, commissioning and performing of contemporary music. And um, I think a lot of people would say, uh, contemporary music, it's okay. <laughs> it's not my favorite. What would you say to somebody listening who maybe is not that open to it or believes they don't like it? And what would you say to, to open their minds or hearts. <laughs> uh, well, I have a couple different answers, but one of them is that no music, it, all music was once contemporary. All music was once very new. And all I'm trying to do is find the Mozart concerto and, you know, the Mignoni waltzes for the next several generations, you know, and that's definitely not going to be every piece I commission, right? It's a numbers game. And it's the same with ICE. You know, ICE has commissioned over 900 
pieces and premiered them um, over our 16 year history. And certainly not all of them are going to live on, but there are many, many that we discover um, that are incredibly beautiful and deserve a long life in the repertoire after we're long gone. And I think that's something that's really close to my heart is like, how do we survive as a community of creative artists? Well, we have to keep it new. We have to keep it fresh. We have to keep exploring the limits of this instrument. I think we've only just begun to figure out like the sound world of the bassoon. There's so many more crayons in this box than, than most of us are using. And so every day I feel like on, like I'm on this, journey of discovery to figuring that out and to collaborating with with composers and improvisers and everyone in our field to say what what is the music of today and I think another big part of it is that like Mozart and Weber like those pieces are great but it's, it's not our music this is not our language mm-hmm. the music that's coming from our peers the music that is coming from this time and I think being a part of that discovery is really, really powerful. And it also makes you learn a lot more about um, yourself and the way that you approach the instrument. I think just touching on the, the idea of commissioning really briefly, because um, I loved Judy's conversation with you guys about the John Williams, Sacred Trees, and that, and how she went to his house, and it was really scary, and it was really hard, and, and she got to work with him on it. And the scary and the hard for me, um, that's what makes me a better player and a better musician. I want the scary and the hard all the time because it pushes me to explore the depths of my technique, of my sound, of my creative creativity, and also of my artistic vulnerability. You know, when you get into a room with a composer and she says, can you make this sound? And you're like, oh, I can't possibly, you know, that for some reason that's always the, oh, no, no, no. Like we want to we want to say no to these things because it's really scary. It's scary to be vulnerable and to maybe like sound bad or look like we can't play something in front of someone else. And same with composers. You know, Judy said that John wrote all these things that like were literally impossible. And that's because composers are just as scared to write for the bassoon as we are to like walk them through this world they don't really ever learn like what the bassoon can really do so we it's our job to sort of help them and have a beer with them and sit down with them for an hour and say like these are all the crazy things I can do what else like what do you want me to try and I think Mm -hmm. by blowing open that conversation like everybody benefits but but it's it takes a lot of trust to get beyond that fear, which is why I encourage everyone, when a young person comes to me and says, can I play one of your pieces? I always say yes, with the caveat that I want them to commission a piece, whether it's from their colleague in their conservatory, in in their composition class, I want them to commission a piece and give it to me in return. That's cool. Mm. That's awesome. (laughs) Because we're all responsible for creating the the repertoire for, for generations to come. Absolutely. I'm just sitting here like, no, <laughs> you're interviewing stuff. <laughs> Wake up. You're, you're not listening. And, well, and I'm just, I'm sitting here looking over to my right and I have the Barrio Sequenza out because I'm learning it for the mm-hmm. first time. And th- this is not the music of today. It's the music of 20 years ago, but it's the first time I've endeavored a large project with this aesthetic and I'm growing so much and I do feel vulnerable and I do feel afraid and I can't remember the last time a work really made me feel this far out of my comfort zone and I even looking back over the months that I've been preparing it I feel like I've grown so much that's awesome it's not even mine you know what I mean and so for you to have this personal relationship with forging these works into being it's just it's super inspiring uh, maybe now would be a good time to talk about your latest album, and I believe I'm pronouncing <laughs> it correctly, Meta Fagace, yeah. is that right? Yeah, it is. It's really tricky. Um, Fagace is the Portuguese word for bassoon, and the, the title piece on the album is by a Brazilian composer, Felipe Lara, um, so it's called Meta Fagace. <laughs> Can you talk to us a little bit about um, how you went about choosing the works to include on the album? Yeah, absolutely. I think... Uh, my first album is like very conceptual and there's a lot of pieces that are super abstract and deal with um, very different sound worlds 
Um, and the second album, I had been, this piece, Metafagotche, had a huge impact on me and the way I was thinking about commissioning and the music that I was working on um, with composers. It's a piece for solo bassoon and six pre-recorded bassoons, and con- two, two of which, which double on contrabassoon. Um, <clears throat> it can also be played live for a choir of seven bassoons, which is so cool. I've gotten to do it live twice. Um, once with the bassoon studio, the amazing bassoon studio at the University of Texas at Austin um, with my old teacher, and then once at my album release show um, last April at the Abrams Art Center with local um, bassoonists in New York. That was really, really, really cool. Um, but when I'm on tour um, or there's an amazing sound system, I'll do it um, with six channels, uh, for, so you, it sort of like surround sound, which is awesome. But the piece, it actually sounds like like nothing I've ever heard before. It's it's this crazy forest of of bassoon sounds, and none of it is electronic. There's no processing. It's all um, the organic sounds of bassoon. And F. Felipe, his the piece, the form of the piece is very classical. Like you can feel the form. It's very clear. Um, there, there's the there's the there's the there's the recapitulation and the you know there's, there's the development, the exposition, development. The rec- it's all of that is really clear, and there are just this augmented sounds that you wouldn't hear in an actual classical era piece. A lot of multiphonics, but the multiphonics are all based on pitch collections that are related to the theme. So it feels. Um, while it's definitely a new language, um, it's a very old classical feeling form for me. I don't know if that was also your um, impression of it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I'd, be, I'd be curious to know um, what your maybe conceptual relationship is with new technologies and recording and processing sounds and like do you think that's where the future is or do you think it's more like in the middle like you were just describing of acoustic sounds um being enhanced or changed that's a really good question and you know the first piece on the album contact nation by Rand steiger is uh almost completely the opposite everything is processed it's it's using live electronics that react to my sounds with different filters. There's, you know, infinite reverb and there's a distortion filter and it changes depending on the sections of the piece. Also really beautiful. And my view of, of technology or um, multiphonics or anything that we would consider sort of extra um, is that these are all tools that we have at our disposal. Um, and I think if musically they make sense, they should absolutely be involved. But if it's for a bell or a whistle that really has no place there within within the music, then forget about it. So I think it's mm-hmm. like anything, like like a like a G sharp. It's a note. It's a tool. If it doesn't belong in a piece, it shouldn't be there. Mm-hmm. And I think I think this is where the conversation um, is so simple, but for some reason gets so muddied when people are like, "Well, I really just like playing pretty music, or I like to sound pretty." and and uh, so contemporary music, no, <laughs> this or that. But I think we forget that music is music. Everything is on a continuum. There's no point at which we say, well, this was music and, and this isn't music. Everything relates to something in the past. And all of it comes from just the nakedness of the human voice. It's what every piece of music has been trying to emulate since the dawn of time. Mm-hmm. And I think... Um, there's, there's music that touches us and music that moves us and music that doesn't. But basically, you know, music is music, and you know something is powerful and good when you hear it for the unsayable ways um, that we've chosen these pieces that are now a standard part of our repertoire. Well, and it reminds me of the David Huron quote, the increased exposure leads to increased liking. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, maybe something is simply unfamiliar and just because something challenges us aesthetically doesn't mean that it doesn't have merit or that, you know what I mean, it it, it can't become something that we eventually like or learn to like. So since you're talking to a couple of educators, I would be really curious to know how I could incorporate more 
pedagogy of contemporary techniques or, you know, the mindset of looking for contemporary music and being more open to it um, in my university teaching? And do you have any, any advice for that? Oh, my goodness. That's such a great question. I love this. So I think uh, with anything, we learn best from doing. Learning an abstract concept or uh, a way to, to think about something is really hard, but learning a piece is easy. So I think, you know, I get this question a lot, like, how do you keep up your technique? And uh, I, I don't play etudes. Well, that's a lie. I ha- I'm looking at my music stand right now. I play box cello suites every day. That's the only um, sort of through line. But learning new pieces constantly um, is always challenging my technique. So I would encourage you to steer your students towards pre-existing um, works that are new, and I can help you guys compile a list. There's really not a comprehensive list, but that's something I'm also working on. More on that soon. Because um, <laughs> there's not really like a database where, where people, and especially students and educators, can search for this information, um, if, it, if it hasn't been featured in the Jolie competition, like people don't know about it. And right. that's, that's, a, that's a problem. So I, I'm, I'm, I want to help in that way. So I think one of two things I would really, really recommend. One, go meet a bassoonist, in the, uh, sorry, a composer in your school. Ask them to write a piece for you. It could be 30 seconds long, 20 minutes. And, and tell them, you know, you'll buy them a beer and put it on your recital. You know, I think when you're in school, like the commissioning thing can be a trade in artistic favors. That's how both sides really, really profit from that relationship. So I think just the experience of having those conversations with a composer and being challenged in that way, you can't, there's no replicating that. Like just going through that process. Maybe it's one piece every semester. All your students have to commission for one piece a year. Um, and then there's like a whole composition slash bassoon or oboe department recital of all of these works. Just an idea. Um, Love and it. then two, yeah, is to really explore these pieces like Olga Neuwer's Torsion, amazing solo piece. Uh, Lisa Lim, an incredible Australian, uh, New Zealand composer has this amazing solo piece that I just found out about. I didn't even know it existed, and we've worked with these a bunch of times. She just never mentioned it and probably assumed that I knew, so I feel bad that I never played it. But that's on my list um, to learn this year. And um, Dai Fujikura has written two amazing solo pieces for me. One is really short on my second album. It's called Following. It's this really beautiful, simple, lyrical piece um, that any level um, could, could learn and it's really gorgeous. And then Calling, his piece on my first album, which is much more intense, intense. It's 14 minutes, but it's solo, solo. All these, all these pieces are solo, solo acoustic, so it makes it really easy on tech. And, um, um, and then, of course, chamber music. There's a huge library of chamber music. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pump something right now. Pimp, pump, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ice is building an exhaustive free database of um, composer submissions, the pieces, and it's free. Anyone can submit. There's no sort of um, artistic bar. Like, it's not curated. Anyone can go on. So we're um, encouraging more and more composers to put information about their pieces, and if they're um, in the public domain, to share PDFs and scores, and if not, you know, share their publisher's information or um, their information if you want to get in touch with them, but it's called Ice Commons. It's just icecommons.org. And that's a really way, and you can just put in bassoon or oboe in the search thing and see what kind of chamber music pieces are on this. And a lot of them are just free and the scores are there and you can just, it's, it's like an IMSLP for new music. Insert. Wow. Yeah, so I would encourage everyone listening to this, get your composer friends to submit information about their work to icecommons.org. Um, and we've given, uh, we talk about this website all the time with um, composition students and with performers all over the world and presenters. And this is uh, something we're doing in partnership with the New York Public Library in terms of archiving and how to create um, a free open source archive. Also, we have on our website, on ICE's website, iceorg.org, digitized, which is the largest collection of new music live performance videos that are free in the world. We accidentally built this when we just decided about five years ago to record in high def three camera shoots like every concert we do. 
And now it's just like, and you can see several performances of, of pieces that are on both of my albums, um, in different places. There's me and the Brazilian in the Amazon jungle in Brazil or like at the stone on the Lower East Side or, you know, in Japan. So it's really, it's, it's a super exciting way. And that's how a lot of people find out about ice and find out about me and, and contact me through the site about pieces they've seen. So cool. <laughs> okay, so you had this big shift in your career where you um, began to forge your own path and become a soloist. I'm curious if kind of comparing before or after and making such a um, authoritative move on your own accord and conviction had any impact on your relationship with either performance anxiety or imposter syndrome and what advice you'd have for someone dealing with that? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Uh, yeah, performance anxiety for me comes and goes. It depends on um, where I am and how many people are in the room and how scared I am about a particular piece. I always love to have some amped up nervousness before a piece. If I don't, I feel like I don't play as well. But of course, there's a limit. Um, but I think joining ICE and being involved in the commissioning of so much rep so that now I'm very busy in ICE. I tour about 40% of my time is spent on the road performing. And I think starting to do that, like six years ago is where it really started picking up and, and ICE became a full-time thing for me. And so just having to go on stage and play like an 18 minute solo piece, perhaps after um, a, a 12 hour flight and no sleep the day before mm -hmm. and being totally jet lagged or being at 12,000 feet after mm -hmm. being at sea level. I mean, all of these things just happen all of the time. And um, that has really taken the sort of preciousness out of any routine before I perform. Mm -hmm. Before I remember in New World, I'd be like, oh, my God, there's a concert at 8. I had, like, all day or, like, a rehearsal in the morning. And I was like, like what do I do? What do I do with my time? And, like, how do I, how do I like, not exhaust myself? But, like, And there were all these, like, I don't know. I would just get so in my head about it. And I think it was the last time, like, I... I had pneumonia. I got pneumonia last month. It was a lot of touring and not a lot of sleeping and a lot of other crazy stuff happening. But I went to the doctor and she told me I had pneumonia. And I was like, well, I just have to play this show tonight and then I'm good. Like, then I can go lay down. Like, holy shit. But I remember being like, okay, this would have freaked me out like a lot, like five years ago. But the, I just, you go into that mode where uh, you, for me, it's, I take just a minute of deep breathing. And with my eyes closed and I get into a super meditative space and then I just focus on the music and everything else in the best world, everything else disappears on the best of days. Um, so for me, just touring and just playing all the time in the craziest of circumstances with like no run up time or like no backstage or like changing the repertoire half an hour before we go on stage um, and being just in, in that mindset of anything goes and being ready for anything has kind of cured me of any debilitating stage fright that, that ever might have popped rear the head. In the light of all that, how do you manage to practice self-care? It's a, it's a really good question. It's actually something that we talk about in ICE a lot as we're aging. Um, I'm almost 40. There are people in the group that have children, although no one that, that tours as, as much as, uh, as I, as some of the core members of the group do. Um, but I, I became really obsessed with yoga about five years ago, and that's helped me a lot because it's something you can do in hotel rooms on the road. I also have a very, very supportive partner. He is not a musician and uh, cooks for me and, you know, otherwise just make sure everything is nice at home. <laughs> <laughs> Pray the hands emoji. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I think um, we're also thinking about that as an organization with an ICE, how with our crazy touring schedule and also, you know, I have a hybrid career. I am an administrator at ICE. I'm currently in fundraising. I'm the co-development director. 
And so between that and, and playing concerts, it's, it's a full-time salary and we have health insurance and benefits, which is awesome. Um, but it's also, it also means that it's kind of an all the time job. So there's not really days off, but we've, we've been talking a lot as an organization, how to build that in and how to um, care for ourselves and one another as we are no longer 20 and need to have, you know, doctor's appointments and like, Mm-hmm. chiropractors <laughs> the things that just happen when you know you're running yourself into the ground but I think I try to consider that a lot and uh I know I I clearly didn't do a good job this year because I got pneumonia <laughs> but I'm okay <laughs> now <laughs> do you have a story of a crazy or embarrassing moment or you know shocking thing that happened on stage I have been embarrassed on stage more times than I can count. But the one of the most that was particularly uh, scarring or stayed with me was uh, uh, was a fundraiser for the Ojai Music Festival. I think it was about two and a half years ago. And I had just memorized Dai Fujikura's Following, which is on my second album. And I was really excited about it. And... I, I'm, I'm starting to memorize more and more music, but it's something that I didn't learn to do as I was growing up as a musician, as a bassoonist in school. I never challenged myself to do these things. So it's still like a fairly new and fairly nerve wracking thing. But I felt really confident because I had practiced so much and I, I felt so ready. But I got on stage and I played the first two lines and I was so nervous. And after the first two lines, like everything just disappeared. It was just gone. And I had a choice. I was, I was like, okay, I can do this. Um, and, or I can stop and like get a music stand and like find my iPad and try to do, um, this all again. So I, uh, I just, I really hope the composer is not listening to this, but I just made it up. I just remembered the the pitch collections and the, the theme, and I totally improvised for the next three minutes. And I got off stage just being like, I can't believe I did that. Like, I'm such a fraud. I'm a phony. And my colleagues were like, oh, my God, that sounds so great. I was like, couldn't you tell that I made this all up? Um, anyway, that was certainly one of the more terrifying moments that happened on stage. But I've since played it from memory a couple times, and it's never not scary. But, you know, you just got to get back on that horse, I guess. You think you like a favorite performance? Oh, I have, I have a lot of those. Uh, I think a real pinch-me moment, there were, there were two real pinch-me moments a couple years ago uh, on stage. Um, touring this one project we did again with uh, composer Dai Fujikura who's become a really close friend and has written lots of pieces for the group he's Japanese but based in London and he wrote us a chamber concerto for five members of ICE and orchestra we premiered it with the Seattle Symphony and we also played the Mozart Symphonia Concertante and I was just like oh wow I'm soloing on the Mozart Symphonia Concertante uh, with the Seattle Symphony and I think it was a moment where I was also like how is my read? Like, what is, what, what is my tone? You know, things where in Dai's piece, of course, I'm always worried about that, but everybody knows how the Mozart goes. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. I feel like that was a p- situation where I was super nervous. And of course, the students are amazing and I respect they're playing so much. So I, that was definitely a moment where I was like, this is so scary. Way, way scarier than a really hard piece that Dai wrote for us. <laughs> um, and then we, we took that, program to Japan and played it with the Nagoya Philharmonic um, in Nagoya and uh, as an encore to the whole program I played Dai's Calling um, his 14 minute solo piece, 15 minutes if I'm feeling like luxurious um, for 3,000 people in this enormous concert hall and I was that was really cool, it felt like an incredible moment and I was really, really nervous before I got on stage because we played this concerto and then I waited like an hour before I played the solo piece. Um, but once I got on stage, I, I feel so grateful that I was just able to be like, holy fuck, like this is awesome. <laughs> and like just let it happen and let myself be present instead of, of analyzing it and, and watching it. 
happen. Where do you, where or to whom do you look for inspiration? Oh wow, that's a great question. I keep saying that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Um, you know, one of the people who inspired me first um, was Judy Leclerc. I was like, wow, a woman can be principal of a student. You know, I think mm-hmm. until we see these things, especially when we're young, um, until we see someone that that looks like us in that role, like we really don't believe that it's possible, um, which is why it's so important to have representation um, of women and of people of color as composers and performers. Also, Nancy Gores, she came to New World when I was there, and I was like, you are so cool and so chill, and you play so well. I was I was just over the moon about meeting with – I took a lesson with Judy when I was uh, – I auditioned at Juilliard for grad school, and I had a lesson with her, and I was just like, I was in love. I mean, she's so amazing. So I think these two women um, – made me see that, like, oh, wow, not only is a career in music possible, but being someone high profile and in these really st- stressful positions um, that people look up to, like, that's that's possible. And so I think that was a really exciting moment for me. And, of course, Pascal Galois has been super inspirational in all his work. I mean, we have so much to owe to him. We have the Barrio Sequenza to owe to him. And um, I got to work with him I think it was about two years ago now, we did a concert in New York, and he's doing a lot of conducting now, or he conducted us, but he and I played um, Olga Neuwert's In Octu Nice, which is actually a cello and bassoon duo, but he had reworked the cello part for bassoon. I think I'm going to unearth the video. For some reason, it's not, it's password protected, but I think all it would, will take is an email to Olga being like, what do you want to call this version of it to get it online? Cause it's really cool. Um, so getting to play with him and, um, that was really inspiring because I think this whole idea of, of being a soloist and commissioning music for you by working really closely with his composers and, and, working with them and not feeling like somebody goes off and writes you a piece in a room somewhere and then you get it and you're like, what the fuck is this? I have no idea what this means. But actually working on them with, with everything from notation to the sound world and saying, well, hey, this isn't great, but what about this? And what about this? And being a, a true collaborator in the artistic process, I think I I got a lot of that from him and it, it made me really excited uh, about doing that for myself and, and for the field um, because all of these pieces, like I my greatest joy is, is having it's hearing students and colleagues um, play these pieces and continue to give them a life of their own beyond these collaborations that I started. So my question is, what advice would you give to a young musician who aspires to have a career like yours? I would say it's never too early to just start doing it, whatever it is. Uh, that you're interested in, commissioning music, making chamber music, starting a chamber music group, starting a new music collective, um, starting to play solo works. Uh, don't just think and plan for it. Just start to do it. When you're in school, there are so many resources that I know I wish I'd taken more advantage of. Um, booking a recital hall, collaborating with other musicians for free, like your colleagues, to, to make a concert. Um, I think we learn by doing is the the strongest thing. So whatever it is, like just start doing it. You don't need anyone to tell you that it's okay, that this is something you can do. Like I'm telling you right now, you can do it and you should do it. And the music that you want to play and that you need to play, uh, it needs to be in the world and it's your job to get it out there. So I don't think anyone else can do that for you. So I think, uh, that's that's the most important thing. And I'm also a resource. People can absolutely reach out to me with questions. I'm always really happy to hear from people about their questions and um, what they're struggling with. Um, but most of the time, I'm going to probably say, like, just start doing it. <laughs> 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 just figure it out. I mean, I still don't know what I'm doing, but I figure out how to do it. I want to work with, like, X composer. I just email them, and I'm like, hey, can I do this? And it's, that, I think that's a, that's a piece of really practical advice that I would, um, give to everyone. Like composers are people too. Like even the super famous ones. If you want to play a piece, you can't figure out how to get your hands on it, just email the composer. Or 
I promise you that there aren't like thousands of bassoonists banging on their door <laughs> figuring out mm-hmm. how to play the piece. Like it just, it, it's amazing how much taking it and a little initiative um, will get you in terms of, of building something for yourself. Rebecca, this has been such a joy to talk to you. Um, would you tell our listeners um, what exciting things you have coming up and where they can find you on the Internet? Absolutely. So I can be found on the Internet. I have a website. It's my name, dot com, Rebecca Heller dot com. Um, and I have a lot of performance videos. And you can stream my first album for free. Uh, it also directs you to all the places you can find my second album on Spotify and iTunes and all those places. Um, and then this season, there's a lot of really exciting stuff happening um, with ICE and with me personally. I have a new collaboration with uh, composer Mario Diaz de Leon, and we just recorded his piece. It's very rough. It's like, uh, how would I describe it? It's I think I, all I can say is that it's epic. <laughs> Mario's, um, besides being, being a you know classically trained composer, is a guitarist and frontman for a pretty famous metal band, uh, and you can hear a lot of those influences. There's a lot of like sustained synth. So this part is for this piece is for bassoon and synth. It's like a it's a duet. So I use a click track to sync with um, the part, and it's so. Cool. So we just recorded that, and we're going to be releasing it as a music video with a light show. And we're working on finding a place um, to shoot that this winter. So that's super exciting, um, working with this amazing video artist named Monica Duncan on that. So look for that coming out in spring. I'll be doing the uh, New York premiere of that, or the world premiere of that piece. Um, no, the New York premiere. Sorry. I, I, I premiered it when it was hot off the presses at the Ojai Music Festival last summer. But the But the... New York premiere will be on April 3rd in New York City, um, and that'll be – yeah, I'm already starting work on my third album. There's some pieces in the works uh, that I'll be talking about soon. And look for very exciting things next fall. I can't talk about it yet, <laughs> but there will be um, – Big, very high profile happening with an orchestra that you've heard of. <laughs> Ooh, awesome. Nail biter. <laughs> it's a nail biter, guys. It's a nail biter. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, this is really, really exciting. I am so thrilled that you guys are doing this podcast. I know I would have been over the moon about this um, when I was in school. I am over the moon about it now, getting to hear people's lives and people's story, but I, I think what you're doing is a real service to the community and I just want to thank you both. Thank you so much. That's it's very sweet. Thank you. Very sweet and we're we're so happy that you've agreed to come on and share your inspiring thoughts and you're a very busy lady. Good luck with all of the projects. Yeah, you thank have you so much. <laughs> thank you. And uh you know if you ever want to do a metafagoche you just let me know. The the uh, ensemble parts are actually quite simple. Um oh. in terms of the, the solo part is not simple, <laughs> but the ensemble uh, parts uh, are quite simple. There's a there's a student at Peabody who's going to do it in the spring with live with bassoonists in his studio. It's going to be amazing. Awesome. Oh my God! Wasn't that interview so amazing? It was wonderful. Thank you so much, Rebecca Heller, for being on. You can find us on all the social medias. Plus, we love hearing from you via email, doublereaddish at gmail.com. And you can listen on SoundCloud, iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube. Check back in with us on the 15th for the next episode.